see, I'm Nick. I'm the um, head of secondary delivery for for, um, for for Arlington Plus, focused on English Marsh, and I'm going to talk you through a randomised controlled trial that we we ran with the EEF in, in Education Development Foundation 2019. I'd to give you before I go into the ins and outs of the results, I'll tell you a bit more about the program, who we are, where we've come from, and um, then we'll go into details about the findings, some of the lessons learned, and then as I said, I'll talk to you about the uh, about our recruitment for for the the trial starting in September. So English Mastery, we are a, a complete curriculum program and we launched in ARC schools back in 2014. We had a focus on designing and launching an English curriculum with a CPD offer, implementation infrastructure and a separate framework to support English teaching, English curriculum across the ARC schools network. Since 2014, we've grown and grown. We're currently working with just over 200 schools across the country in a range of contexts. Uh, the EEF trial that we ran in 2019 was disrupted, but I'm still going to share with you some of the insights we gathered from that. So ARC Curriculum Plus is a part of the ARC Schools family. ARC Schools being a multi-academy trust with schools in Birmingham and Hastings. Excuse me, can Port I just ask a question, sorry. Um, of course are we can, able right? to get um, copies of this as well afterwards? I will, yeah, we, I'll, I'll, put, I'll stick together a PDF of the, of the deck and send that through. Brilliant, well. because I was starting taking notes and I thought, well, actually, if we could have a copy, that'd be easier. Thank you. I'll, I'll, you'll get a recording and a PDF so you can enjoy it in a multi multimodal um, RP event as well. Thank you. You're most, you're most welcome. So ARC and Curriculum Plus is part of the ARC Schools uh, family. ARC Schools are running a uh, number, uh, number of schools, uh, primary, secondaries and all through across the country. And the, as a part of that, that, uh, that family, ARC Curriculum Plus, we have a series of mastery programmes, English Math Science Mastery, and our mission is to empower teachers, to give every young person the subject knowledge and skills they need to allow them to succeed. So we're all about working in partnership with schools and teachers and empowering them to be even more effective and even more successful in the classroom. Bit of a history lesson then. So why exactly did English mastery come about? Back in 2014, we, we undertook a, an extensive kind of audit of practice across our network and also beyond, beyond the art schools network. And what we found was pass rates were good, but progress wasn't. I.e. what we saw was that uh, we were getting good rates of the C+, plus, but when we were looking at that value add, when we were looking at those students who should, should have been getting those Bs, As, A stars, we weren't doing those students justice. So the pass rates were good, but we were focusing on that C threshold rather than unlocking those grades, those higher students. We also saw lots of key stage four were spent playing catch up, covering some of those fundamentals that we'd have hoped to have seen covered in key stage three. Commonly, it is still it remains common that our most experienced skilled teachers are deployed on GCSE, and that leaves a, that left a real void of clarity around progression, entitlement, um, and what exactly a high quality key statutory English curriculum should look like. And here, this um, this uh, scheme of learning is an illustrative point. We might see the first unit in Year Seven autobiography unit could have been piled together from, um, it could be just an old unit they've taught forever. The next unit on the landlady could have been something that was pulled off lit drive. The theme park unit could have been cribbed from a range of different sources from the TS. And then everyone, teachers, raid the, raid, raid the, raid the stock cupboard, pick a book, and different students in different classes will be doing completely different texts with no real understanding of how they all tie together. And what we found was that there wasn't a clear understanding of how a year group should all come together, but also how those texts and those units should be uh, adding cumulative value term to term, year on year, so that the, 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 the total is greater than the sum of its parts. The students really were able to graduate with that fantastic foundational knowledge that they needed to access those more challenging texts at GCSE. All of those findings, all of that, those, that kind of research we did internally was really helpfully summarised in a 2015 report by Offset, key stage three, the wasted years, that really spelled out in no uncertain certain terms the challenge that those those same challenges were seen across the sector, not just within the art schools network. So armed with armed with that, we also knew that in addition to 
that curriculum, that pedagogical challenge, we're also facing a workload crisis. And this was a, a workload survey complete conducted before the pandemic. So some of this will be outdated and I do suspect that it'll be, um, be perhaps even worse today. But in that work, DFE workload survey, 38% of the teachers saying planning was an unnecessary burden with duplication and bureaucracy coming at the heart of that frustration. So for example, SLT saying, I need to have your lesson plans in this pro forma and it must be in on the t drive a week in advance and that not leading to the best planning activity that a teacher could perhaps undertake we see teachers spending nearly nine hours a week on lesson planning which is an equivalent to an hour and 45 minutes per day and i think you'll see straight away that that isn't covered in ppa so teachers spending a lot of their own time a lot of time when they could be with their families when they could be making Jubilee trifle when they could be going on, you know, spend it, spend quality time with it in their lives, planning. And that workload issue is real, isn't it? It's, it's a real challenge that we want to that we wanted to support the support the profession to really think how we can we move the work this workload issue a bit forward a little bit more. So we had all those challenges that we knew we wanted to undertake. This then led us to to really do our homework and look at what does education research tell us about the subject domain of English, about how we learn, what does cognitive science tell us? What does education research tell us about how students learn to read, how we learn to write? How can we take more innovative and appropriate assessment uh, pedagogies and make sure we're not just falling back into familiar traps? And again, this is a, a life after levels at time as well. And how can we foster that training and community to really support our, our teachers, our colleagues, to, to, deli to implement this programme in the best possible ways. And there'll be a number of names there which you may be familiar with, so Daniel Willingham, um, Sweller and Cognitive Load Theory, Michael Young and the work on powerful knowledge, Isabel Beck on Tier 2 Vocabulary, um, Daisy Christodoulou, her work on assessment, Daisy being one of our, our, our the founding members of English Mastery. And that gave us some really clear intent, right? What, what were the intentions for our curriculum? And the EEF would call these the active ingredients of the programme. And we've got a really clear understanding of our pillars, the power of a knowledge rich approach to teaching English. Helpfully, in, a, in the Ofsted review, research review that was published a couple of weeks ago, knowledge place to, is placed really at the front of that. We believe in teaching writing separately to reading and decoupling those really complex pieces of instruction. We put vocabulary as a really common, uh, as one of our, of our main pillars and the power of tier two vocabulary to allow students to become more fluent in their self-expression, but also in their reading. And also the, the role that assessment has to play in understanding students' strengths, weaknesses, and where gaps in knowledge can be closed by teachers at the moment they happen rather than letting them um, grow further and further and further apart. So they're the pillars and those pillars play a key role in every single part of our programme. So our curriculum progression framework, how are students graduating through the curriculum term to term year on year. We also see them in our lesson resources, our lesson guidance, in our training and development programme that, that supports its teachers and in the assessment materials that complement the programme each way as well. Here is a snapshot of our curriculum map. I'll, I'll share this, you don't need to, don't need to worry about, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to be testing on this, but the this is to illustrate how with a curriculum program like English Mastery, we can be really explicit about what exactly is it that students are meant to be mastering at any point in the curriculum. And then later on in the curriculum, we can have really great confidence, really great faith that students should be fluent in these domains. So in Oliver Twist, if we're looking at life in Victorian London, we know that in subsequent years in Sherlock Holmes, we can draw back on that knowledge. In Jane Eyre, we can again, Think about how that pastoral setting is different to, um, to, to, to London as well. And we can be really clear, we can really clearly uh, demarcate what is the powerful knowledge that we want students to be mastering and graduating each unit with. And I'll illustrate how that kind of the, the impact of that in a second. So just to just to again add a bit of texture to that, I, in our Victorian strand, year seven, we look at all of the twist, we look at the city, we look at how Dickens creates all these fantastic characters, we look at the role of antagonists in a, in a novel. When we look at Sherlock Holmes in year eight, 
The city that Holmes and Watson find themselves in plays a key role. The characters that Sherlock Holmes, how we see Holmes established as a character through Watson's uh, reportage is also something we can draw in from one of the twists. And we have some really interesting antagonists in, um, in Sherlock Holmes with Irene Adler as a, as a great example. He's Sherlock Holmes' foe, but she's also not a typical, she's not a villain. She's someone who offers him an intellectual challenge. Um, so he's, he butts up against her, but she isn't a villain in the same vein as Fagin and, and, and Bill Sykes. We can then layer on top of that the notions of scientific developments in the age of the industrial age, periodicals, Sherlock Holmes' dual nature. So the fact that he can be introspective, but also can be fervent and energetic. And again, when we come to Jane Eyre, we could, all of that comes into play again. The pastoral setting offering a really interesting contrast to that of the city and, 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 and the, the worlds of, of Lowood and um, uh, of, of Lowood School Hatton contradicts, contradicts or contrast rather with some of Oliver's settings. Victorian morality, childhood, again, that, that those layers building up and up year on year on year. And then what I hope you can see as well is regardless of the Victorian text, which your students may be studying at, G, at GCSE, that powerful knowledge will be able to offer them just such a strong platform with which to, 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 to launch themselves from. And a huge amount of powerful knowledge there that is going to be just so you of such great utility for whatever it is that students are studying at uh, GCSE. In ARC schools, uh, Jeff and Hyde tends to be our, 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 our preferred text. And you can see how city antagonists, morality, dual nature, duality play just absolutely critical to all of those all of those texts um, on GC syllabuses. And that this is just a single snapshot of a resource from our from our curriculum. Knowing exactly the the knowledge that students have embarked have graduated from throughout year seven, eight, nine. This is a this is a um, a, a resource from our Jane Eyre unit in year nine. We know that students have studied Caliban and the Tempest, Prosper and the Tempest, Box Animal Farm, Helen Burns early, at Helen and Jane early in the unit, and Oliver Twist in year seven. When we, when we know that students have this shared understanding, this common taxonomy, we can do some really interesting things with curriculum design and task design. And we can ask the question like, which of these characters would you describe as a hero? Are all of these characters heroic in the same ways? Could some of them perhaps be interpreted as tragic heroes? Which of them are responsible for their own demises? Which of them break free of that, of that tragedy? And with that common curriculum, knowing that students have encountered these characters and really discussed and debated them in depth, we can do some really, really interesting things with, uh, with, with, with that discipline of English as they move throughout the curriculum. So, so that is, that's it in theory. That's the kind of principles. OK, it, sound, it sounds all right on paper. What does that look like in students' work? So what we have here is a paragraph from a year nine student's essay on Jane Eyre. This student is answering a question on how does Charlotte Bronte present Jane's childhood experiences? It's a closed text assessment and it's done under examination conditions. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you one minute to read through this. This isn't the whole response. This is just a paragraph from that student's response. So this is a year nine student's uh, response on Jane Eyre. All right, I know it's Thursday, I know it's after school, but we can do a little bit of interactivity. In the chat, if you could type out anything that you find this student has done successfully, anything that you'd like about this year nine student's response, if you could pop any, um, any observations in the chat.
I'll give you a few seconds and then what I'll do is I'll narrate how we think this student came to write such a successful kind of response. Yeah, use of quotations, yeah. Contextual references, really structured formal language, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, tier two vocabulary been used throughout academic vocabulary. Excellent. So what I'm going to do, great. And what I'm here to sort of suggest to you is that this isn't an accident. We can, there is a lot that we can have in our, in our control as you know, curriculum designers and in, in schools to maximise the likelihood of students writing this, this kind of standard of work. So I'm going to talk you through, I, I flashed on the screen a second ago, the curriculum map. And I'm now going to pull out some of the key parts of the curriculum map that students have been taught that lead to this response. So in year seven, we spend a lot of time focusing on writing correct topic sentences. Students doing that here. How to use evidence to support a point. In all of a twist, we look at the mistreatment of orphans. We also look at how Dickens uses Oliver Twist as a way to convey a moral message. And again, Bronte's doing that here with Jane Eyre. We explore the poor sanitation of disease in the Victorian era and its effects. Then in year eight, across the year, we look at how to link analytical paragraphs across an essay, how to use topic sentences to, to embed that and to link analysis across a piece as well, how to skillfully embed quotations um, and, and how to make that a, a, just a fluid part of composition, the role that status has to play in Victorian society, how to control and how to manipulate multiple subordinate clauses to, to articulate a complex thought, how to compose a balanced argument, uh, and how to look at explore a topic from a, a range of different perspectives. Then in year nine, with that Jane Eyre unit of work, we look at how to build evidence to support a thesis across a whole essay, how to use the apostrophe of possession, the temptation and fall of Adam and Eve, the impact and the role that that has, the influence that has on, on literature. Specific Victorian attitudes towards childhood, e.g. a child is born innocent versus a child is born in sin. The vocabulary that Brocklehurst is a Christian, but a moral hypocrite. And some specific Victorian diseases such as typhus. And if we look at the curriculum app, we can see we've taught it. And then by revisiting it, by knowing that it's something that she has encountered, we see students, we see that manifest in students' performance when they come to write about these texts. And this is a real, you know, this is a student who's obviously really, really engaged personally with this text. They've got a lot to say about it. And we can really see their enjoyment of, of Jane Eyre shining through in this, in this really rich interrogation of, 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 of Jane Eyre. So that is an over, like a snapshot of the, the lesson resources, the guidance, the curriculum framework and how that what that looks like kind of in, in students' performance. But it's also really important to, to acknowledge the role that, that like, the, the, the lesson resources set of set a zip file fire of resources isn't this isn't the key to um, education like transforming education outcomes. It's all about that that um, that final foot right and it's the role that the teacher has to play in making that curriculum and owning it and making it work for the students in their classroom. Curriculum will be strong in intent and implementation when teachers have a dynamic relationship to the knowledge that they teach, when they own it for themselves and they feel that it is their own curriculum. And that is exactly what we support schools through. It isn't ARC's curriculum, it's your school's curriculum. And that's a key message that we, we communicate with school leaders and subject leaders too. So how can we encourage that, um, that, that ownership? And I think we'll think back to that one hour and 45 minutes of planning time a day that we spoke about. Here are some things that teachers might typically do during planning time. So they might make a worksheet, they might make a PowerPoint because it's got to be on the T drive. They might write a list of questions for our students. They might look through some exercise books and see um, conceptions, see how students perform in, in yesterday's lesson read the chapter that you're about to teach next day, maybe annotate the book, the, the, that, that text that you're about to teach, do some tertiary reading, think about critical interpretations, think about some other commentary on the text, and close any subject knowledge gaps that a teacher may have. So if you're trying to do that for your six lesson timetable for tomorrow, you've got an hour and 45 minutes, you're spending under 18 minutes per lesson trying to do some of those activities and think practically 
if you're a teacher, you've got to get that content prepared. You're most likely going to be focusing your time on creating that worksheet and that PowerPoint presentation because that's the that's the kind of the crutch, right? For, for you know, that's what we just teach to us is that <laughs> is that fallback that they have to have that prepared. We'd argue that that might not be the most powerful activity that a teacher can undertake when doing that planning time. Like right? that's a resourcing activity. They're creating a resource rather than planning for engagement, thinking about how to anticipate misconceptions, how to make a text come alive, how to really engage and motivate their students. So if they're lucky, maybe if it's their second year teaching that text, or maybe they've got they've got some fantastic resources available already, maybe they're reading the chapters about the study, perhaps they're thinking about the, uh, the subject that they're teaching and closing their subject knowledge. But there are some even more powerful things that we think a teacher can do, which is really pinpointing their questioning, thinking about how to elicit those, um, those that key bit of understanding, how to anticipate errors, anticipate misconceptions, identifying gaps in students' knowledge, seeing how students are engaging in their written work and thinking about um, how that can how that can be moved forward in teaching, annotating a text so that it's really intuitive for a teacher how they're going to really make that um, make that text come alive. And that's the, the, the part of the workload challenge that we that we work with teachers is to move uh, curricular thinking from a resourcing activity, I've got to write this retrieval quiz, to a planning activity, to that implementation activity where they can make that curriculum really come to life for the students in their care. And one way we do that is through our co-planning resources where we encourage departments to sit down as a team and really get under the skin of the text that they're studying. It can be looking at, uh, we, we, we suggest a dosage of an hour a week, and there we look in for teachers to really support each other, challenge each other around what exactly do we want students to be getting out of this? Why are we teaching this at this moment? And we've got a, 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 a implementation infrastructure that supports that. We also have anytime access teaching overviews where we have expert teachers talking through the curriculum where the, where it's made really clear this is the intent behind this sequence of learning and this is how you can make it work for your students um, and it's all there for, for it's all there for teachers to geek out and to, to consider what is it about this subject this topic this text that we want students to be grappling with right what is it that is important to us and our context for students to be really thinking particularly about and that professional development offer I've spoken about very briefly has been acknowledged by the EEF as a as a really as a real strength of our program. We've been highlighted as a case study in their guidance report on professional development, and the co-planning documents are just a small part of our implementation training offer. Across the whole piece, we pay careful attention to how a teacher's own knowledge is built and developed, and our our team use a variety of strategies to help te to manage teachers' cognitive load and revisit prior learning. So we'll look at the pillars that inform our programme and think how, we, how do we want teachers to engage with that and how do we build that pedagogical and research base across their time in, in the partnership with English Master. So we had, um, to before we're going to talk about the EEF report in just a second, we were selected for an EEF trial in 2019 due to the success of a, the pilot that we ran in ARC schools. And in 2018, uh, an independent evaluator assessed our, our cohorts and found that on average, students made more progress when they were studying the English Mastery Pilot Programme than some of the ARC students who were not part of the pilot programme. Uh, with a, a month's progress, a, a additional month's progress of four months. And it was this piece of um, smaller scale independent research that led the EEF to evaluate our programme back in 2019. So what exactly did that trial find in 2019? I'll talk you through it. It's, um, I'll talk you through the findings and some of the lessons that we learn as a programme as well, because there's some really powerful messages for us to, for, to, to improve our, our provision too. The trial launched in September 2019. We had 97 schools participating in a randomised controlled trial. And the way that that works is half the schools are informed that they're delivering English mastery and half didn't know the control group. And the idea is to compare the performance of those two groups of students at the end of two years and see which group does better. Is English mastery better than what a, um, uh, the students who do English mastery make more progress than schools who would do their 
their business as usual curriculum. So we're comparing the progress and attainment between the two groups. And in addition to that, for the very first time in a EEF um, report, they also investigated the impacts the programme had on teacher workload. This is our logic model. So just to, to offer a, just a little bit of insight into some of the rigours and some of the, 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 the work that goes behind the research trial is, this is a way that we can represent all the work that takes part in English mastery, all of the things that we do with schools and the outcomes, the outputs we'd expect to see, the impact we would hope to see. So we can see here that um, a part of our curriculum assessment program, these are all the documents, the resources I've just described. All of these are a key part of the activities that a school would be undertaking. That's complemented with that professional development offer and not I've hardly spoken of that, but that includes induction training, uh, remote development sessions where we'll do an online call with a school and say, how, how's it going? That's what, what, what you have to focus on. We'll go into a school and see how implementation is taking place in classrooms and offer some kind of mentoring, coaching, reflection on that, that classroom practice. We'll also have termly assessment sessions where we'll say, how have your students performed on this task? How does that compare to a national cohort? How can we move your, your how can we move that these students forward even further next term as well? So huge professional development offer that complements the entire program. And that leads to these uh, these kind of numbered named outputs. So the, the quantity of training, the number of lessons that we provide as part of the program and the uh, some of the ways that the students participate in the assessment protocol. We also have those teacher level outcomes, teacher level outcomes. So we know that for us, we want to empower teachers. Teachers are, teachers make the difference in the classroom. And how can we uh, empower teachers to make even more of an outcome? Well, it's uh, uh, that, that more effective teaching of those texts of grammar, of, uh, of assessment vocabulary. And as a result of that, we'd hope that students are more confident, more articulate writers. They are more accurate and incisive readers. And they, 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 uh, they have a more complex and nuanced understanding of vocabulary as well. So this is a logic model that sits alongside it. It's a key part of any research project. And it helps to under, it helps to show if the inputs are these, we'd expect the outcome, we'd expect the impact to look like this. Sadly, because of uh, the, the disruption to COVID, we weren't able to get the, uh, we weren't able to get the outcome measures on pupil attainment. So we weren't able to say students doing English mastery made X months progress, which is how the EEF reports typically uh, come, come by. However, there were really extensive interviews conducted with teachers who did English mastery and in the control group. So we have a really high quality qualitative report um, and tells us how teachers feel English mastery impacted their own practice, on students, on students' work, but also on, on their on teachers' workload too. And there's some really compelling uh, data here. So I'll, I'll go through some of the statistics, but also add a bit of texture with some quotations from the report as well to just add a bit of a bit of colour to that as well. So teachers overall, teachers said English mastery improved students' attainment. Seventy four percent said it improved their grammar skills. 63 said it improved their reading skills, 68 said it improved their writing skills, and 75% said it improved their overall progress. These are really, really positive results for an independent evaluation. It's worth making that really, really clear. These are very, very compelling, really positive results um, with our independent evaluator, that said. And what, what does that look like? What does that sound like for a teacher? Well, Here's a teacher describing the impact of that, uh, that knowledge-rich approach and specific vocabulary. Key words that students build on, corrupt, naive, malicious. We've seen students retain that from year eight, which has been amazing because you can see that's the impact of retrieval and interleaving. It's been really impressive. So teachers seeing the impact of that curriculum structure on students' um, uh, performance. We also saw teachers really rate the way that we that, that the curriculum. 89% of teachers saying that the literature strand is quite or very effective, and 73% of teachers saying that our writing curriculum was quite or very effective. Again, really, really compelling numbers there. 
and to speak about our writing mastery, our, our, our language course, my subject knowledge with grammar and how we teach grammar has improved hugely. Speaking to other teachers across the department, they too agree with that. The subject knowledge that we teach of grammar, we've all improved 100%. So again, that grammar, that grammar program really supporting teacher subject knowledge. More broadly, how do teachers feel about the program at a more at a higher level? 81% recommend it to another school. 84% satisfied with the training and support that we offer as part of our, of our um, partnership with schools. And that's where those school visits, that, me that online mentoring really play a key role where it's that, that um, intimate relationship with the school where we really understand your context, your needs. The English Marshall team gave really excellent feedback and got down to the nitty gritty of what our problems are and how to iron those out. It's brilliant actually. So again, a huge amount of confidence placed in the, the support that, that our team of uh, school development leads offers schools um, in that implementation, that implementation framework. And this one for me is just like, I'm, I'm really proud that we've been able to support teachers in what has undoubtedly been one of the most challenging few years of practice that anyone's probably ever encountered. And teachers saying that, 80% of teachers saying, the English master reduced their planning and marking workload is just so cheering for us to see that we, we, we're, we're supporting the sector and supporting teachers with that um, with planning and, and marking, especially during all of the challenges of, of COVID. And it's not just, I don't have to plan anymore. I don't have to worry about, I don't have to, I don't have to think about planning. It changes that activity. It changes what planning can and should be. What we're now, again, this is a quotation from teacher, we're now able to think about how we deliver the resources. It's something that's quite empowering to be able to not have to think about the nitty gritty of PowerPoint slides. We're actually able to think about how we deliver that curriculum content. The ability to able to think of it as a teacher rather than a design of a PowerPoint slide is really, is very liberating and a far better use of teacher's time. And that's exactly our conviction. That's exactly our belief that when we remove resourcing and producing resources as a as a kind of as a burden on teachers, we we unlock some much more interesting thinking process. We unlock some much more powerful activities in that planning stage, uh, and it's again really really powerful for us to see that that impact having taken place in a classroom. Um, and yeah, to just to, just to kind of return back to that logic model, they were the they are the outcomes that we were looking for. They were the outcomes that we hypothesised we would see in in teachers in students, and it was really great to see that 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 did come into play. There was a real close correlation to the impact that we we expected to see and the impact that teachers reported as well. It's also fair to say that taking part in an evaluation process, like it, it, sh it, it sheds a very, very stark light on English mastery. It really brought home a number of issues around our curriculum that we'd um, kind of intuited for, no, for, for a while and really placed them before, gave us lots of food for thought and has given us a fantastic impetus to, to change our programme and really fantastic days to, to improve our programme even more for future cohorts. So here are, here are four of the, the big ones that we really wanted to, that we really uh, had to, have to and had to address. Uh, again, these are the basis of the report. Increasing the diversity of text offered to study as part of the literary heritage strand and include more contemporary texts. Ensuring all materials are thoroughly proofread. Teachers noted that for programme promoting SPAG, it was poor practice to have grammatical mistakes and typos in those materials. Could not agree more. Improving emphasis and clarity on the importance of co-planning, those moments when teachers come together to, to think about the curriculum and how it effectively contributes to the high quality delivery of the programme and work with schools to plan how co-planning can be prioritised. Other teachers felt uh, mastery writing was not stretching the highest achieving students and wasn't preparing the producers. So it's all really important challenges for us to hear and to, um, to, to, to plan for how to address. I'll speak about a couple of them. Um, the diversity of text is something we've taken very, very, very seriously and really wanted to move the needle forward on this. So we under we we can we composed a group of teachers from across our schools to form an equality, diversity and inclusion working group to interrogate our curriculum, not just the texts that are on that 
on that spine, but how we teach the techs that are currently on that on that spine as well. And what we've what we've seen there is the introduction of a brand new unit of work, uh, Andrew Levy's Small Island into the Year Nine curriculum. But we've also uh, undertaken some really powerful partnerships with with um, with colleagues to improve how we how we teach other parts of the curriculum. For example, in Oliver Twist, we have a lesson where we work in partnership with the Jewish Museum of London, and we explore the role of anti-Semitism in the portrayal of Fagin and how uh, how it was problematic in the Victorian era, how it's um, problematic today, the role of anti-Semitism in literature and the representation of Fagin. So some really powerful, nuanced um, uh, improvements to uh, representation inclusion in the curriculum. Likewise for The Tempest, an exploration of the character of Caliban. Uh, we had a group of our, uh, of our equality, diversity, inclusion working group collaborating with us and saying, and, and really completely overhauling the ways in which we discuss Caliban as, as, a, as, a, as a black character. How can we actually approach that characterization in much more thoughtful and sensitive ways rather than um, polarizing as either good or bad actually he's a character worthy of much more nuanced complex interpretation and we had a group of teachers really um, supporting us to to improve the way that we that we approach that that character we've invested a huge amount of uh, of time to uh, and worked with some uh, proofreading companies to go through our literature, uh, our, our uh, language curriculum uh, to, to proof them again and come up with it's, it's a, again it's a slow painful painstaking process but we've produced uh, brand new iterations of our entire language curriculum to, uh, to to scrub out any any errors and inconsistencies there so a, re a really a really important investment for us and the co-planning is an ongoing part of our training offer we work with We've developed brand new training models to show what good co-planning looks like. This is what uh, how to establish a culture of co-planning where teachers feel empowered to have those discussions and how can we support schools to make sure that that doesn't get absorbed into just departmental time where we're talking about data entry or sanctions or who's the detention duty and actually to protect that as time where teachers sit and really get under the skin of, of the curriculum intent. Likewise, we're working on some brand new uh, units for our writing program. So we've got a brand new creative writing unit, which can put, which we hope offers offers a really high level of challenge to to all students, uh, but really uh, gives those higher prioritizers some some chance a chance to let their to, to spread their wings and really really kind of um, really do some interesting work there. So. Again, that's just just scratching the surface of the of the report and the, some of the suggested improvements that the EEF um, unearthed and how, how we've been trying to address that in our in our across the program. So that is a whistle stop. That's been a whistle stop tour of what is English mastery, what goes behind the program, what's in the program. Uh, and what exactly did the 2019 report, evaluation report, say about, about English mastery? And we're really, we're really proud, really, really proud to have been able to support teachers over the last um, three years with that, with that trial, particularly during COVID. And we've been very, very, very equally proud of the positive stories that have come out of that report from the EEF. We're currently recruiting for a new a, a retrial of English mastery because the the data was so, so compelling, so, so positive. The EEF are uh, running a new randomised control trial for English mastery. And we're inviting secondary schools to uh, across England to, uh, for, to participate starting in September 2022. It will, Im it will assess the impact of a knowledge-rich English curriculum on pupil progress for 2022's Year 7 cohort. It will track them through Year 7 next year and then Year 8 the following year. And it will also consider once again how that centralised curricula can contribute to reducing teacher workload. Just as in 2019, the randomised controlled trial will place schools into two groups, the treatment group and the control group. Schools who are part of the treatment group, uh, they will be randomly selected by our independent evaluators, Sheffield Hallam University, to receive English mastery, to do it, to, to run English mastery. 
schools who are in the treatment group will need to have some skill in the game so they will need to pay to uh to part with english mastery and it is uh heavily subsidized is putting it lightly schools will pay 900 pounds in year one and 900 pounds in year two which is a dramatic saving on the um on our standard program offer where there's school visits and and, and uh, regular regular training with, with schools half of the group will be um uh oh and worth noting the evaluation will assess the impact on 2022's year seven cohort um but a school will access the whole key stage three package you'll get the access to the whole key stage three curriculum resources but it will only assessing the impact on the year seven cohort the control group will be randomly allocated to the to, and, they will, and they will continue their english curriculum in whatever guise they see fit so you can either continue to do your own curriculum you can adopt your trust curriculum you can go elsewhere and if you if you'd like to purchase a, a, an alternative curriculum you're at perfect liberty to have complete ownership of your of, 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 of whatever you'd like to do you just won't be able to work with english mastery for the duration of that trial in uh, recognition for participating in the trial and for undertaking some research activity, which will be taking part in interviews, submitting data, a the control group schools will receive a payment of £1,250 across the two years for completion of all the data requirements. So it's a, 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 an acknowledgement of uh, participating in, in that research activity. To be eligible, you have to be an English state school, so uh, independent schools are ineligible. You have to be non-selective and uh, you have to have a year seven cohort in 2022 and then a year eight cohort that, that those students need to have be going to year eight in 2023. Worth noting because that may exclude some middle schools and uh, it's also the trial is not available for further education uh, settings. And you can't have delivered English mastery in the past. The next steps are the uh, we if you are interested in, in in learning more, you can book a call with one of our team. There's a link on the screen. And if you've got a smart device, you can uh, scan that QR code and book a call. We will invite you to complete a memorandum of understanding. And the next randomization date is the 11th of July. So we're trying to bring it as forward as we possibly can. That is the, uh, but that is the, the the date that the we've worked on with the evaluators for the randomization. So you'll find out before the end of term if you are in the trial or if you're in the control group. And there'll be some, and we'll work with the, the English mastery schools in those uh, in that final week of term to get you all ready and set up for implementation in September. So you may be able to see. But that is slide 53. 53, we're done. We, we, we got through it um, in record time, I might add as well. Thank you all very much for joining. What I'm going to do is I'll stop, I'll stop sharing. And um, if you have any questions you'd like to ask about the program, about the 2019 trial, about the new trial, be more than happy to field them. You can either pop them in the chat or if you'd like to come off mute, I'd be happy to answer them um, in that, that way too. Um, does being in a middle school disadvantage you in terms of selection? Uh, no, not necessarily. It's the the it's the independent evaluators are will will look at a, a variety of factors, including geography, including um, EAL. But it wouldn't. I wouldn't say it disadvantages you in any way. Okay. Thank you. Hi Caroline, so if we're a control school, will we receive the curriculum at the end of the trial? So if, uh, as a control school, you uh, you would be eligible to work with English Mastery in September of 2024. Um, you wouldn't automatically get English Mastery, You'd, you, you, would, you, you could become a partner school of ours and you could um, uh, pay that partnership fee to work with us. And we would hope to be able to offer you a substantial discount if, 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 if that were the case, if you're a control school. Zarina, how is impact measured at the end of the trial? Great question, thank you. So the, at the end of the trial, the, the uh, Sheffield Hallam University, our evaluators, 
will select a group of students from the treatment schools, the English mastery schools and the control schools. And they will sit the GL assessments progress test in English. That's an external norm reference assessment. And they'll use that to benchmark student attainment across the two cohorts, the treatment group and the control group. And they'll use that to assess the relative impact of, of the program. Um, and the GL progress test in English is a nationally benchmarked norm reference assessment. And it's a, it's a good and fair measure of, uh, of student attainment at uh, the end of year eight. They'll also be conducting interviews and surveys with the teachers. So there'll also be a qualitative element of the report, just as there was in 2019. School, uh, the GL assessment is provided by the evaluation. So um, that, that, the, 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 that you don't need to worry about that. that the, the, the GL assessment is a part of the evaluation and the independent evaluators, that's all part of the, uh, you, you, there's no additional outlay for that. Access will be given, yes. And it is my understanding, so if you are familiar with the GL progress test in English, it also offers a really interesting report on student strengths and weaknesses. And I feel my, my understanding at the moment is that you'll also be able to access that student report as well as a result of participating, which is really helpful for those students who have completed the, uh, the test. Do let me know, Caroline, if that didn't answer your question. Hi, sorry, it's Serena again. <laughs> I'm okay. just going to, rather than type it in chat, yeah, no, that's it's right. to ask. Um, can I just ask, in terms of the, if you were selected to be a control group, um, what would be the data requirements to be submitted? Is that just the GL assessment or would there be additional data? There'd be additional data. So we would look, we would ask you to submit your year seven cohorts, um, key stage two SATS results. There'd be some other demographic information as well that would include um, the, the, uh, the, the, the pupil number, uh, sex, date of birth, um, EAL status, uh, SEN status. And there would, uh, and would uh, you'll need to do that at regular interviews, intervals throughout the trial, just to make sure that we have an understanding of the cohort um, and any kind of attrition of students throughout the trial. So it's, 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 it's data yeah. that you'll have on Sims or Bromcom. It would just be putting a report on that, um, but it would be, be anonymized, uh, anonymized data. Super, thank you. I leave wait time in case people are typing it out and it takes, it takes like kind of a few seconds to type that question. So, um, so I, I don't, People always say I love an awkward silence, but it's, it's, it's a typing silence, it's a respectful silence. Well, in which case, um, uh, if, there's, if, it, if there's no further questions, Your Honour, we'll follow up with you um, probably tomorrow with a, uh, a, a copy of that slide deck, uh, hopefully an access to the recording. And we'll also pop a link in where you can book, book that call. Um, and um, we, we hope to speak to you over the next few days and to, to, to work uh, and to find out how we can work with you and your colleagues to, 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 um, to work on the trial. For those of you with GCC cohorts, wish you the very best of luck tomorrow for, the, for, that, for that final exam. Hope it goes really well for your students. And, um, and we look forward to speaking to you soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening.